We welcome 
It's getting harder to recognize the person I was before I encounter Christ. I don't walk like I used to. I don't talk like I used to. I've been washed from the inside. I've been washed from the inside. It's getting harder to recognize the person I was before I encountered Christ. I don't walk like I used to. I don't talk like I used to. I've been washed from the inside. I've been washed from the
performance of perfection or striving for acceptance. Let me tell you, it's only by the blood. It's never been, it's never been about deserving or earning. It's a gift that's freely given. Let me tell you, it's only by the blood. Come on, you gotta believe it. It's never been about performance or perfection. Striving for acceptance. Let me tell you, come on, you gotta sing it. It's only about the blood. It's never been. It's never been about the truth. Oh, we never heard it again. It's really given. Let me tell you, it's only about the blood. Does anybody, does anybody wanna be holy? Give it to me. Hello and welcome. My name's Robert Barsamian, and I lead our usher team here at Without Walls Church. We hope this message blesses you today, so please like and subscribe for future messages. I'm excited. Uh, if you don't know this, uh, I'm, I'm repping some of our new merch that's out at the... Uh, so if you want to get this, this, this is actually a pretty cool jacket, man. It's, uh, it, it'll keep some of you warm who need to be warm. I'll probably be sweating by the time I'm done up here, but nevertheless... Uh, you need to get back there because it's going to be gone, I'm sure, before, uh, before this day is up. And there's some other great stuff back there for you. The only reason for this is, you know, you have a message. This is like John 3.16, for God so loved the world, you know. And, and, and so you're standing in line, you know, at, at Target or not, you don't go to Target. I mean, you got at Walmart or, uh, you know, Dillard's or wherever it is. And, and people behind you sit there and you're, you're like a walking billboard. You know, and, and you don't even have to say anything. But a lot of times, you know what you get. I get this all the time, especially my not today Satan shirt. I wear that, I wear that out and, and I'll get the way to go. Yeah, yeah, you know, because people need to be uh, lifted up and, and edified. And sometimes you don't even have to open your mouth to do so. You just got to bear it. So th that, that's, that's what this is about, really. It's not just clothes, you know, but it's, it's something that we can use uh, to be a light uh, in, in our world. So 
Uh, I encourage you to get out there and do that. Listen, in a couple of weeks, don't forget baptism. If you have not been baptized, uh, or, or I know some people say, you know what, it, I, 50 years ago, I did it. I didn't, I, I just don't, you know, things have changed in my life and I've, I've grown and I've come a long ways and I've, you know, I have a different understanding of who God is. And I just feel like I want, I want to rekindle that and reestablish that, you know, that decision. You, you're welcome to the last baptism we had, there were two or three people that, that carried that. But just in a couple of weeks, it'll be on what we call Friendsgiving Sunday. Let me emphasize, and I told the staff, I'm going to emphasize this this week and next week. Uh, it, it'll be emphasized because what Friendsgiving Sunday, the third Sunday of this, of this uh, month is about, we just designated as a day to just do that, to reach out to your friends who don't attend church or are just waffling around out there and, 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 and they're, they're searching and they are looking for an answer and you've got the answer. That day is the day to invite them to Without Walls Church. Uh, it'll be a celebration day, the people being baptized, uh, you know, everything we do on that day is kind of be centered around understanding that there's going to be many people in the house and watching us that maybe just don't have any understanding of who God is or who Jesus Jesus is or what he even did. And we're going to, we're going to, that day is just, we're by the Holy Spirit's and prompting, we're going to tailor the service for that day. So bring them out, bring as many, let's fill the house afterwards. We're going to have the food trucks, the kids will have the jumpies and we're just going to have a little dinner on the grounds and some fellowship and community It without Walls Church. It's going to be a great day. So plan on that. It's going to be exciting. Now I'm in this series uh, called The Problem is Mixture. And where we have gone uh, and where we have come from to, to this point here today, in the first message, I just wanted to back up and just kind of give you a brief uh, highlight and recap of what we've discussed. In the first message, we talked about the fact of how mixture comes into our life. And oftentimes there are things that are, that you're battling and dealing with in your life that you never asked for. You, you may have never even initiated something to, to bring that thing into your life where you're battling with it now. And we talked about in that first message, how oftentimes many of those, those things can come through the bloodline. We talked about the iniquities of the you know, third and fourth generation like Exodus talked about. And we, and we, we, we dealt with some things and, and just understanding that there are, there are things that are passed through the bloodline just like there are things passed through the bloodline on a physical level. There are some of you that have blue eyes because your grandma had blue eyes. There's some of you that, that you know, uh, you, you, you're going to be tall because your family line are very tall. There's people that, you know, are going to be stocky and muscular because the Hulk was your uncle. You know what I mean? You, it, it's passed down through the bloodline. There's this thing that happened. The same thing is true on a spiritual level. You don't understand why it is you, you battle with, you know, with, with a lust or why you battle with anger. Why do you fly off the handle so quick? And your dad, you know, battled with that. And your great grandpa battled with that. And, and you go back and you look at why, do, why am I doing? I don't want to be that kind of a person. There are things, there are different avenues that mixture enters your life. And that is one way that we looked at and how to overcome it. The second message, we went and we talked about the parable of, of Matthew 13 about the wheat and the tears. If you remember that, if you don't, you need to go back and listen to it because it'll make sense even more uh, to what we're discussing even here today. But it, it was about the parable that Jesus shared where the, the, you know, they, they sowed, uh, the, the master had uh, seeds sown into a garden. He comes and he looks at it the next day. And all of a sudden he realizes not only is the wheat growing, but there's tears. Tears were like a weed. Tears is the, the unacceptable. You, you don't want it. And it was growing up along with the wheat. And, and we talked about the fact of, of what do we do and how do we handle those moments and seasons in our life when we are sowing good seed, expecting a good return, but we're reaping a bad harvest. How is it that we deal with that? How do we battle through that? How do we overcome those things? We, we talked about that in that second message. You need to go listen to it again. And then uh, last week, we talked about uh, Mark, the fourth chapter, the parable of the sower. If you remember right, the, Jesus shared this parable and he gave it in a story form about a sower who sowed seed and it fell on stony ground and, and you know, it didn't take root or did for a minute and then it was gone and the birds came and ate it up and then this, you know, it was sown on thorny 
ground and then it was sown by the wayside. And then, you know, then there was some seed that fell into good ground. So we, we looked at the fact that we got a 25% chance of seed being sown into a place that will reap a good harvest. And, and so what do we do with the other 75% mixture that comes into our life? How is it that every time the word, and this is what Jesus explained to his disciple, that the seed is the word. And when the word is sown into it, Satan comes immediately to try to steal it and take it away. So even what you receive in a setting like this, what you receive in your quiet time, what you receive when you're reading the word, and then you leave that moment and you go out into your, your schedule and your routine in the world, what happens is you can get easily caught up in the, in the rhetoric and you can get caught up in the, in the stuff and you can get caught up in the schedules and the routines of your culture and, and your life and quickly you forget what you even received this morning through the word. And Satan comes immediately to try to take that and so that what happens is then you begin dealing with the mixture and you're going back and forth. One minute you believe you can overcome, the next minute you don't see any hope of how you'll ever overcome. And it's back and forth and back and forth and it's a frustrating cycle to be in. But we ended last week with the, with the revelation or the realization that in order to overcome the, in any area of life, we understand that the word Jesus said in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, there's the, there's the prerequisite. It's a pursuit of him and him only. And it is the receiving of his truth and his word implanted in your life. Not just, you know, a few verses, you don't know just John three sixteen, but you know, you know, a word that will pertain to the area or the struggle that you are facing in your life on a daily basis. And the, the thing is, you've got to go get a word on it. The reason that so many believers are not seeing results and to their prayers is because they don't have a word on what they're asking for or what they're coming to God for. Get a word on it. He promised that he will watch over his word to perform it, not over your desires, your pleasures, your wants and want tos. It's over his word. So if you want to see things accomplished in your life, whew, Go get a word on it. Amen? Now, that brings us to today. And today, I want to take it a little deeper off of where we were last week, but it will tell in a slightly different direction, trying to pull all these pieces together. And when Jesus said in John 16, 33, he was telling his disciples things and about what was to come and, and, and what they could do and what they were to be in John 16. And, and, and he came to a part near the end of that chapter where he said, I tell you all these things so that in me you will have peace. Notice where he said, it wasn't like in the church, so that you know, in your, your religious community, he said, no, in me that you will have peace because in the world you will have tribulation. You will have struggles, trials, things that bring frustrations, things that get you just, that feel like you're getting beat up. And the minute you think you've got victory in an area of your life, then all of a sudden, man, man, you, you, it's like you fall off the wagon and you start getting pounded with this guilt. Like I'm never going to change. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I've tried, I've worked on this over and over and over and over again. And I don't know, God, help me, help me. We cry out to God and we know that he can, but we just don't think he will because we've been around this track so many times. You ever been there? I mean, I, I know you all are holy, but please, I mean, <laughs> have any of you ever been there? I mean, you understand, right? I mean, I, I've been there and, and, and I still go there in places in my life. And I think, dang, why? I thought I had this. I, I thought I had this thing figured out, God. And it, it shows me continually how I cannot rely on yesterday's word or yesterday's revelation or yesterday's blessing, but I've got to continue to pursue him with total abandon and I can't give up, man. I've got to keep pounding. I'm, I'm gonna keep calling on his name. I'm gonna be searching after him and focusing on him. My target is him and him alone in his presence. I want his word, not just uh, around me. I want it in me and coming out of me. I want it to be the very life because it's in him that I live and I move and 
I have my being. So that is scripture, by the way. See, that's what the word does. When the word gets in you, then all of a sudden you find that it begins just to flow out. And it's not because anybody's attained any certain thing. It's because if you truly desire something and you reach for it and you're hungry for it, then there's nothing that stops you from being able to do it because he gives you, he gives you that right. And when you receive it and it is implanted in your soul, James said it's the implanted word that is able to save your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, your past, your experiences, everything that you go through in your life. We think that just praying the prayer at an altar saved your soul. No, that transformed your spirit and regenerated your spirit. The saving of the soul comes through the renewing of the mind, Romans 12, 2. That's why the washing of water of the word is so critical and so important in our lives. That's why Jesus said, if you abide in me and my, my words abide in you, then that sets you up from a foundation and a platform that whatever you go through in life and whatever you're declaring and whatever you're asking will be done based on what is in you. Okay, that's my first sermon. So what I want you to know today and to remember is that Jesus didn't come. He didn't come just to give you eternal life. Jesus came so that you would have victory. See, look at John three sixteen right here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. That's a promise, and and we know that, and and so we take that at face value. But then Jesus said over in John 10.10, he said, the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have life more abundantly or life to the full or life in, in, in increase and, and in, uh, in abundance. So the thing is this, is it's not only about the eternal life, but it's about the life here. It's not about just going to heaven. It's about bringing heaven to earth. See, you, you can be saved and your destination is heaven, but listen to me, you can still live a life of complete bondage on this earth because you're only as free as your mind is. Now follow me. In Genesis, the third chapter, Satan took mankind captive. And he didn't, he didn't take us captive by, uh, you know, using a gun, a knife, a bomb, or any other kind of natural weapon. He took us captive with a lie. He took mankind captive with a lie. And the first thing that he said to man when he came on the scene was this. Has God surely said that you can't eat from the tree that's in the center of the garden? And he went on to say, because God knows that the day you eat of that tree that you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, we understand, if you, at least you need to know this, that Adam and Eve were already like God created in his image and in his likeness. And somehow, somehow a deception or a mixed, a mixed message came in to their environment and into their, their atmosphere and the opportunity. And what happened is they steered from this long enough to grab a hold of this. Because you understand that, that Satan has to first disarm you before he can defeat you. And see, what had happened is God had already established and he had already given Adam and Eve his word and his commission. And the first thing that the devil did when he came and he attacked man was he brought into question the integrity of God's word. And so what happened is he defeated them. They got sucked in and they bit on it. And that was because they were disarmed by the lie. But God always has a plan, church, always. Some 4,000 years later, roughly, the second Adam, Jesus, came, and he came as the Word incarnate. He, 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 came, he came, remember, we talked about John 1 last week. You know, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And then in verse 14, then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And so he came as the word incarnate and he came to defeat the enemy, to defeat Satan and take the curse off of us and give us eternal life. And not only that, but to give us back the truth that can make us free. 
John 8, 32, you shall know or have knowledge of the truth, and it's that truth that you know will make you free. So the mind is the main battlefield of good and evil. And any time we, um, we talk about spiritual warfare or we talk about engaging the enemy, when, and Satan is our enemy, what we are talking about is the main battlefield for that engagement will take place in our thoughts. That's the main battlefield. Now, Paul makes this very, very clear in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, in the, in the, uh, starting in the third verse. And here's what he said. He said, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. In other words, they're not fleshly, but, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Notice how much knowledge is used here. I mean, it's, it's, in the, it's in the realm of, of, the, of the thinking aspect, the mind, the attitudes, the belief systems, and anything that raises itself up against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, Paul is basically saying that, that we are in a war against our thoughts. And, and in that war, we, we have got to focus on bringing everything into captivity or bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And listen to me, a thought that you don't bring captive or you don't bring into captivity takes you captive. And let me even say it this way. A thought you haven't brought into captivity likely has you captive. A stronghold, a bondage is simply a house of thoughts I mean, think about this. If, if, you, if you struggle or, or you're in bondage to fear and depression and unforgiveness and lust and, and anger and, and even addictions of all kinds, including even substance addictions, the bondage, that bondage is a house of thoughts. You say, wait a second, substance has to do with actual something. No, no, no. It's a house of thoughts because the problem is not the substance, it's how you think about the substance. It's how you think about what it does for you or can do in you and what you like about it. See, the problem isn't the circumstance because we're gonna have circumstances in life, good and bad. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that it rains on the just and the unjust and sun shines on good and evil. So we're going to have all kinds of circumstances, but it's how you think about the circumstances circumstances and that determine your reaction. It's, it's not about your past. It's how you think about the past. Yes, your past, some of it may not have been that great. Some of it may have been wonderful. But the fact is, is are you choosing to live and put roots down in the past to where your past now becomes your present, which then dictates your future, meaning that your future will always be a repeat of your past? It's how you think about it. It's, it. The problem isn't what somebody said negatively about you. It's how you think about what they said about you. Is, is it true? Well, then why don't you just deal with it, shift it and change it and move on in freedom? If it's not true, then just brush it off and declare the goodness of the Lord and continue walking in the favor of God. It, it's not the issue. It's not that, it, it, is, it is how you think about it. So the strongholds and the arguments that Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 10 are those areas of life where the enemy comes and he introduces thoughts to you that are contrary or are not consistent with the truth of the word of God. And understand that's all he can do. All he can do is introduce it to you, throw it out to you, and it's always going to be up to you whether you choose to latch onto it and bite on it. Because you cannot, you cannot solve a spiritual problem with your flesh. Every time you try to use the flesh to overcome thoughts, you are fighting the enemy with the wrong weapon and you will lose because we are the gatekeepers of our mind. Satan doesn't decide what I think. And know this, God doesn't decide 
what I think. I decide what I think in the realm of my soul. Am I going to choose to think thoughts of truth and righteousness, or will I choose to think thoughts of lies and deceit? It's always going to be up to me. And for me to be totally free, I'm talking about walking free from bondages and and struggles and strongholds, to be free without mixture, then I've got to come to the point in my life of understanding that my mind is the battlefield on which the enemy will engage me. And if I'm going to win that battle, then I have to make my priority has got to be to make Jesus the Lord of my thoughts. It's got to be. And Psalm 107 kind of clarifies that for us. And it's in, uh, excuse me, it's it's not Psalm, but James 4, 7. It says, therefore, submit to God. We've heard this verse before. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Then the very next phrase is resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, how many want the devil to, be, to flee from you? How many? Okay. Okay. So then you've got to resist him. But to resist him, you first have to submit yourselves to God. It's interesting. That's what Dina was talking about this morning: is submitting our life and 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 laying down laying down our wants, our desires, our our, our agenda. It's, it's got to be pushing everything aside and and picking up His heart and His and His calling on our lives. See, without submitting to God, you don't have a chance of defeating and resisting the enemy. I'm just telling you that right now. But but if you do submit yourself to God then you got every chance of defeating and resisting the devil. And another key point for us to understand is that the word of God is, is a spiritual weapon that is far more powerful than most Christians realize. Let me show you what I mean. Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10, it says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You're not, it isn't about the person sitting next to you. Not that you're having a battle with them, (laughs) okay? Not that they didn't do something you didn't like, you know? Uh, But it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against words and actions and how somebody, that snaky little face they gave you. It isn't about that. That's what you get all bent up about and, you know, and you get, you get, all funky in your life and you allow it to, to be how you then gauge your life and the decisions you make and the actions you take. No, 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 no. Our, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Those four categories or those four uh, realms, that, that, is, that is giving you the rank and file of Satan's army. Satan's legion of demonic force, the, the, spirit, the spirit realm. So we're, yeah, we're talking about demonic forces, demonic spirits. When you're calling those things, that is where our battle lies. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Withstand what? The things that we just listened, that we just listed there. And then having done all to stand, Stand therefore, having girded your waist uh, with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of of peace and above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So what Paul is telling us right here in Ephesians, he's telling us to be strong in the Lord. That's how he started it off. In the, in the Lord, in, in the power of his might. It isn't your intellect. It's not what you've accomplished. It's not, it's not the, the way, even the way that you were raised in your home, unless it aligns with the truth and the word of God. But be strong and faithful and, and the power of his might and not in ourselves, but in the Lord. And then he tells us how to do it. He says, now put on the whole armor of God. And then he gives the analogy 
of the armor that a Roman soldier of that era and that time would, would put on. And let me show you here, and just take a few minutes just to walk through this armor briefly and show you the, the six aspects of the armor of God. Because here's what I want you to understand. They are all truth. They're all truth. In, in other words, he's telling us to put on thoughts. That's what he's telling us to put on. It, it is a thought. It is a pattern of thinking. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He, he's telling us how to put on the armor to where our mind, which is the battlefield, right? That we are going to engage the enemy on is our mind. This is, this is clothing our mind. Let's just look at this armor for a moment here. The first one we're going to talk about is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Now, a Roman soldier in that era, he, he, would, he, would, he had a belt that he would put around uh, his, his waist. And that's why the Bible says his loins are girt about with truth. That's, a, that's your waist area. Now, now understand that, that uh, this belt housed uh, you know, a little loop that he could put a sword in. His sword could hang there. Probably another one on this side for even a smaller weapon like a dagger or whatever. And then most of the belts, especially the ones for battle, they, they all had long, uh, long about down to the, above the knee, thick leather straps that went all the way around because it was hard sometimes for, for a, a spear or whatever to be thrown uh, to actually penetrate a thick leather. Sometimes they would even put a, a light metal strip over that leather all the way around. And this, this girded their, 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 their loins. And understand that this part of our body is, is where we reproduce and where we eliminate. Now, I'm not don't being gross. I'm just telling you, this is the way that God created the body. So you understand that when you live a life based on God's word, then you will reproduce truth and you will eliminate lies. But if you don't live a life based on God's word, then you will reproduce lies and you will eliminate truth. In other words, you have to decide, does, does what is coming into my life, does it match the word of God? And if it doesn't, then it's gone. But if it does match the word of God, then I'm going to embrace it and I'm going to reproduce it through my life. See, that's the belt of truth. It's truth, truth is the standard. And then it leads us to the, bless, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, this is, a, this is another truth, okay? This is the word. This is a thought that you put on. And, and, and this is the area uh, of your vital organs, you know, the, the, the breastplate. And uh, in a war, if you want to take a kill shot, this is where you aim. I mean, this, this is your ticker. This is your heart right here. And, and likewise, we have to parallel this, that the enemy is always out to kill and to rob you of the joy and the faith in Jesus by condemning you. And so what he does then is he comes to you and he says, you're worthless. You'll never measure up. You're no good. I mean, look at all the mistakes you've made. Look at how many times you've fallen off the wagon and he'll keep driving these things into your, remember, he'll introduce these thoughts that are contrary to what God says you are, but he'll keep doing it. He, that, those are the fiery darts that Ephesians is talking about. He just keeps shooting it at you and you're either going to, you're either going to be on guard and you're going to be guarded against it where it doesn't affect you or, or you're going to get tired of it. You're going to get weak and you're going to get casual and get unaware and you're going to start taking some hits and it'll take seed in you. So it's up to you what you do. But the thing is this, is, is every time he comes to get you, what the breastplate of righteousness says is that the blood of Jesus, we were singing that song earlier, the blood, that the blood of Jesus is the strongest cleansing agent that will ever be. And when my sin hit that blood, they were gone forever. And now I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's who I am. That's who you are. Do you understand that? So it's, it's not the breastplate. We always get the picture of putting something on. This is a thought. You're, you're picturing yourself. This is how you see who you are and your identity in Christ. Then we go to the helmet of salvation. I think saved thoughts because I'm a saved individual, right? Because being saved means preservation and deliverance from harm and, and ruin and loss. And when I think godly thoughts, 
When my mind is fixed on him, my mind is protected. And that really goes along and ties with a passage that we talked about last week in Philippians 4. When Paul said, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are are worthy of praise or of good report, he said, think on these things. And then the verse prior to that, he said, and the peace of God the peace of God will keep your hearts and minds. Not only, not only the, 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 the core of your, of your being, but your intellect, the soulish part, will keep your minds in Christ Jesus. Remember, if my words abide in you, if you abide in me, this will keep, that, that, that's what thinking on these things. So these things are in alignment with the truth of God's word. Now that when you talk about peace, and that leads to the next, the next piece of the armor, which are the shoes. Our, our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shoes of the gospel of peace. I, my life is not about pleasing me. It's not about the accolades of men. It, it's, not, it's not about fame and fortune. It's not about getting more stuff into my hand. My life is about glorifying the one who saved me and the one who empowers me by his grace. And therefore, then, everywhere I set my foot, I am prepared to deliver and to declare the gospel of peace. And I'm taking back ground that maybe I allowed the enemy to steal from me in the first place. It's, 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 it's a readiness. It's a, it's a preparation. And then we go to the shield of faith. Now, this is an interesting one. Because the shield actually is something that was a, in, the, in the Roman, in this era, for the Roman soldier was a full body shield. It wasn't just like a little Captain America, <laughs> you know, thing like that. No, this, this, is, a, this is a full body shield. So, so it would cover roughly, probably 80% of a soldier's body just at full standing. So you can get it up around the face and it would take it all the way down to about here. It can't be, couldn't be down to the ground because then it'd get clumsy. But the thing is this, is it covered even the other armor that you already had on, which really gives us a picture of how faith is applied and the standard of faith in our lives. Faith, faith is, the, is the covering over every aspect of our life. In other words, faith is the foundation. It's the platform. It's the launching pad that, that we live in and carry out our life by. Paul said that the, you know, Paul said that, you know, we walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. You know, it said the faith comes by hearing and, and hearing the word, the truth. So everything is always connected in that. And, and, and so even Hebrews 11, you know, goes on to say that without faith, it's impossible to even please God. Well, I want to please God. So that means that my standard has got to be this, this shield or this protection of faith that covers everything. So faith is applied in even what I already possess. In other words, I have faith that I'm saved because we are saved by grace through faith. I have faith that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I have faith that the truth, that this word is true and forever. I have faith that, that in the good news of the gospel of peace. I have faith in that. In other words, that's what I practice. That will go before me and will be around me. It will be my standard. But then we come to the sixth piece of the armor. And this is the one armor, a part of the armor that is the only uh, offensive weapon. Everything else was defensive, covering up. But now we have the sword of the spirit, which the Bible says is the word of God. Now, understand this. This is power and authority. This is power and authority. Jesus himself, he defeated Satan in the wilderness. When he was taken into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, no food, fasted. And then Satan comes and, and tempts him in really three areas of life, which coincide with 1 John, which is the pride of the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in that area. And Jesus was tempted in those areas. And every temptation that, that was brought to Jesus, here was his response. He said, Satan, it is written. In other words, he, he had the word in him. He was the word made flesh. But the fact is, he had the word. 
And, and in the natural, he would respond and he would deliver the word and he drove, he drove back the enemy. I mean, I mean it, it's, it's interesting that, that you could almost envision that the word of God is like a, like a nuclear bomb to the powers of darkness. And, and all six pieces of this armor, all of them are truth. They are truth. It is a thought that we put on. It's, it's a thought that we establish as a pattern of thinking. He is telling us to put on a thought based on truth. The word, John 17, 17, thy word is truth, Jesus said. Now, look at Hebrews 4, verse 12. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful. There it is again. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner, check this out, of the what? Ah, there it is again. It's, it's in that realm again. It's a discerner of the thoughts, not only the thoughts, but the intent of the heart. Of course, so it's not even what I'm thinking, but it's what, it's what drives it. Remember we talked about iniquity? and transgressions in the first message. And, and, and a transgression is a sin. It's an act. It's something you do that's seen. Okay, I, I, I sinned. I did this. I got angry. I flew off the handle. I, you know, whatever. But an iniquity is the root of what produces the transgression. So here, he is saying this, that it's, it's not just the thoughts, but it's, it's deeper. It's the intent of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, uh, uh, of him to whom we must give account. Now, it says here that the word of God is living and it's powerful. You read all other books. This book is the only one that reads you. <laughs> See, when, when, when you read the word of God, it, it comes in to your life and, and it's living. And it says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and the word even can go as far as to tell the difference between soul and, and spirit. So if there's any demonic stronghold or any bondage that in your life that you're struggling with, it cannot hide from the truth. It cannot hide from the word of God. See, it's, it's living and it's powerful. So we, we understand that, that this, is how, this is how we have to perceive the power of the word of God. And, and a lot of times people ask, well, why, why did he use the analogy of, you know, it's uh, sharper than any two-edged sword? Here, here's why. Because when the word of God comes into your life, it does two things. First of all, it seeks out the enemy and slays him. And it also seeks out your wounds and heals them like a scalpel. In other words, you could say that the word of God is a killer and a healer. Now, here's where Psalm 107 comes in, verse 20. It says that he sent his word and he healed them. Okay, there's one. And then he delivered them from their destructions. Two, twofold, two things. He healed them and then he delivered them. Now, this, this is the weapon this is, the, this is the power of the weapon. This weapon here, the word of God, and it's not, again, when I hold this up, I'm not saying it, it's, it's the black ink on white pages. I'm talking about the spirit behind this word. This is God breathed by his spirit through the hearts of men. I'm talking about what the words do. They are spirit and they are life. When they come into your life and they take seed and they're planted, all of a sudden they, they begin to take on a whole different realm because the spirit that regenerated you at salvation is the same DNA as these words right here. So when they are poured in and they come together, all of a sudden you are creating a spiritual synergy that begins to stir and begins to be built up in your life. That's why you can't ever give up and stop. That's why if the word is, is ceases to get into your life, then you begin to dry up spiritually and you're trying to live and function based on yesterday or last year or five years ago's blessing. You can't do that. This is, this is nourishment for your bones. This is something that has to be applied every single day of your life. Every day this must be, this must be a part of, of, our, of, of our routine. And I don't want to say make it sound really casual, but a part of our schedule. 
schedule, a part of what we should do and what we get to do. And it's applying his truth to our lives and realizing that it is sharper and powerful than any two-edged sword. It is the very thing that discerns the thoughts of our mind because when your mind is right, so is your life. Amen? Now, total freedom comes through the ministry of truth. The ministry of the word. And, and I'm, ta- I'm talking about freedom from strongholds and bondages that literally neutralize and can neutralize an individual's life. You know, a lot of times, you know, there will be people that will say, help me, I've got a demon. And, and, and what you need to understand is, is, is a lot of times people, people are oppressed. We call it demonic oppression because it's certainly not godly oppression. So we call it demonic oppression and they struggle with things in their life and they figure, wait a second, I prayed a prayer. I I got saved. I gave my life to Jesus. How come I'm still battling with this? How come? So they're they're in bondage. it's, it's, It's the realms of darkness that rank and file. It's the army of the enemy. It's uh, demonic spirits that are out to get and to destroy and to bring down and neutralize your life. And so we get oppressed and we're pounded with these things. And the reason that, that people are oppressed like that is because they've believed lies for so long that now the lies have actually set up camp in their mind and have become what the Bible calls strongholds. In other words, they've taken captivity, your belief system, and it does not produce life. In fact, it only produces and it, 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 it produces death and destruction. It, it, it is something that is stolen from you that is rightfully yours. And listen, that's where, that's where anxieties and, and depression and hopelessness and, and fear and, and the frustrations and addictions, that, that's where they come from. It's that whisper that you have allowed to become reality. And, and so you start to just think that, oh, it's just you and maybe this is the way that I feel. And it, it tries to integrate and blend itself to where it becomes who you are are. Listen, that's not demon possession. That is where you have to and must continue in the word, in the truth, and to know the truth because that's the truth that will make you free. We we just got to get into the truth. And what's interesting is that as you continue in that vein, as you continue to minister truth, the lie is, is losing its grip and the stronghold is beginning to break down and eventually the truth will absolutely cut that cord. You see, what happens today a lot in the church is we get more demon-focused than truth-focused. And so what happens then is we end up looking just to programs to find deliverance and to find freedom. And, and, and there are a lot of great ones out there. One of them is right here in our church, our Sozo ministry. Man, it has been instrumental in, in helping people to get through and that initial door to, to get rid of the, 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 the binds and the chains and the, the bondages that hold them. And they've been able to break free. Countless people have walked into freedom and stepped in that, through that ministry. But there are far too many of those ministries that are just strictly going after the devil. And they fail to actually build and teach extreme truth. And the thing that people need today and what people are lacking is the understanding of truth. See, you you can feel free and content after a deliverance session, but if you leave that, that moment, and you go away not having an understanding or a knowledge of the truth, then you're gonna show up again next week even more frustrated than you were today. And it's important because what happens is far too many people are beat up and they're beat down and they're rocked and they're, they're reeled and because they're, they, they need to establish identity. So they're going everywhere else trying to find it. And the lie is absolutely eating your lunch. And, and if you continue just to focus on the lies and focus on fighting the lies, then you fail to build truth. It's what I, I tell people. I... I, I, I Uh, counsel people on this all the time. If you get up every day with a sin consciousness, 
versus a victory consciousness, you're, you, man, you, you're, you've, already, you've already neutralized you for the day. So if you get up out of bed and you sit on the edge of the bed and say, dear Lord, God, thank you, you know, Lord, that you're Lord of my life and please help me today not to lust. Please help me today not to go to that website. Please help me today, Lord, not to fly off the handle and get angry. Please, God, help me to, to love my spouse and not get, you know, cantankerous and complaining with them. Please, Lord, help me to be, you know, help me to be a good parent. I haven't been so good lately. I haven't been doing a good job. And we always come, help me to be better. We, we always come from what we have to do and what we need to come from to get up to here rather than getting up based on how God sees you and what he has declared. If you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, you have to, re that's the thought you put on. So instead of getting up and say, God, help me not to, get up and say, God, thank you that I walk in purity today. Then my mind is clean. I have the mind of Christ and I hold the thoughts and the feelings and the purposes of his heart. Then I'm a believer and not a doubter because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Thank you, God, that I have a sweet spirit, that I'm compassionate. I'm not flying off the handle, but Lord, that I will have a long-suffering heart and an attitude because you live in me. That is with the fruit of the spirit. Help me to be a peacemaker. Help me to show love. Help me to be kind today. God, I thank you that I walk in kindness because your spirit is in me. Thank you, Lord, that, that I, I have the strength to stand up and know that there is no weapon formed against me that will prosper. All those who rise up against me will fall. That's what you go into your day with rather than, oh God, please help me not to. Does that make, does that make sense? That, so what that is, it, it, it's, it's an understanding of the truth. See, many of you who have come in here today, and those of you who are watching in our online family, you're only, you're only finding your identity by the things that you've done or maybe what you haven't done. You're only finding your identity in what you've accomplished or maybe what you didn't accomplish. You, you're, you're trying to find your identity based on what somebody said about you or what somebody didn't say about you. And you're like, man, you're, it's just like this constantly. And one minute you're up and you're like, got it, I got it. And the next minute you just, you, you tank out. And you're, you're at the bottom and say, how, God, how did I get her? I'm a Christian. This is supposed to be different. Can I tell you, your identity is in none of those things. But I'm trying to tell you today, church, that your true identity is in the love of your heavenly father and the work that Jesus finished and completed on your behalf on the cross. That's where your identity lies. And you just can't come and, and keep focusing on the lies of, well, this is who I am, or this is what I've done, or this is what people say about me, or this is how much I've messed up and done the same thing over and over and over again, even when I said I'd never do it again. And you're pounded with this. Man, and, and you wake up and you've done such a good job at just callousing it and justifying it. And I'm just gonna go forward. God knows my heart. Oh, dude, he knows your heart. Who knows the heart? Man, it's deceitfully wicked above all else. It's only God who knows your heart. You can't use that one. God knows my heart. He, he, you, you're, you're right, he does. You don't. You don't understand it. But what I'm telling you right now is if that's how you're trying to find and discover your identity in Christ is by everything that surrounds you, then you have, you have taken on a weapon to use against an enemy that will wipe you out every time because that's not the, that's not the weapon you use because your fight is not against flesh and blood. But again, it's that spiritual, it's that spirit realm and God has given us because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. That means that everything that comes against us from that realm, we do have the power. But if you don't understand and you don't have knowledge of the truth to know how to apply it, like Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And you just begin, it just comes out of you naturally. 
See, if you, put a, if you put a plate of Brussels sprouts in front of me, I don't care how much you dress it up and what you sprinkle on it and how pretty the plate looks, I will, I'm just telling you, I don't even think twice about it. It's gone out of my life. I, I, it's just, I don't like it. You don't have to tell, it's just natural. That's my, that's my, that's my instinct because that's, my, that's the way I believe concerning Brussels sprouts. Okay, so the thing is this, is the word in you that is, that is the, that's the place that we need to strive for to be so full of the word that naturally when something is presented or you are tempted with something that maybe you even bought into and were a part of in your past life, that when it comes, it's like, Ugh, I don't even look at that. Get away. And you just turn, you resist the devil and he flees from you because you've submitted yourself therefore to God. You see? So here we are. Here we are right now. We're not trying to go through this. We're not believing the lies. We're not going to go there. But if that is you and you feel like that's where, let me tell you, that doesn't mean you're an unbeliever. No, what that means is that there is a stronghold that has been built up so strong in you that you now need to take the truth and like a sledgehammer, you just start pounding that thing again and again and again and again because the truth that you know is the only thing that can break the stone. The truth you know is the only thing that can move the mountain. The truth that you know in your heart is the only thing that can calm the storms of your life. The truth that you know you have knowledge of is the only thing that can remove the hindrances and the the barriers that stand before you from moving forward. The truth that you know is the truth that will make you free. I'm telling you, I feel like today there is an anointing in the house church. Stand to your feet right now. I I don't know what you have been struggling with. I don't know what area of life has just been a, uh, a stronghold in your life. I don't know what area do you feel like you you had victory and then you feel like you don't have victory and it's back and forth and you are just tired of the frustration. You're tired of the cycle. I don't care what it is. It can be dealing sick. It's always going to come from the mind. It's going to come with how you perceive things. But you've got to get you've got to get it right and it starts by submitting yourself therefore to God. So I'm just seeing this. I'm seeing this this morning. I'm seeing this altar as, as, as honestly, I'm seeing it as a place of of breakthrough. I'm seeing it as a place of of just a, a total increase and stepping out of and stepping into. And I don't know, but I'm going to make a call for people this morning who are just tired of the bondage of your life. I don't care. And if you think, well, I don't want anybody to know I have a bondage. Well, <laughs> come on. I'd almost say that probably everybody in here has got some area, maybe some not so, not so much. But I'm telling you, if you're struggling, you want to take the step to be free, to step out of that and begin the journey of freedom. I'm going to ask you to come down and get down to this altar right now, and we're going to break through this morning. Come on, anybody, area, whatever area. It can be lust, it can be gossip, it can be judgment, it can be unforgiveness, the things, the rejection of your life, all the stuff that you've, that you've just kind of blanketed over. I'm telling you, this is the moment right now. Just begin to cry out to God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Say, God, I lay it down. I lay it down. No more am I going to pick this up. No more. Father, I'm, I'm giving my life to you and to you alone. Man, I, I pray that you'll take what I am and who I am and the destiny you placed in me. Breathe, stir it up. Stir it up in me. Stir it up. God, let it come to the forefront. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed this week's service. Please like and subscribe to this channel to stay involved with all of our content, but also download our app, Without Walls AZ, to stay informed of what's going on in the future. In the meantime, God bless.